I don't believe in church. How many of you have ever heard that statement? Maybe it goes like this, though. I like Jesus, but I don't like church. I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in church. How many of you have ever heard that before? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Okay, so that's kind of like more and more popular, I think, in the culture, in the world that we're living in. I was actually studying just this last week, and I had this like image up. I don't believe in church on my computer, posted it. And I had one of my pastor friends lives in a different state. He reached out to me. He says, Pastor, don't give up already now. He was just messing around. <laughs> don't give up already on church. And then he sent me a meme that I wanted to show you guys. Maybe you've seen it before. But pastoring, as you know, can be a challenge. And, and, and so this is like pastoring day one. I can sympathize with this. How many of you know the grades are coming in? You know what I mean? So, but, but for real, it's honestly been pastoring has been such a a joy. It really has. And I got friends who, who didn't start a church from scratch, kind of like we did. We church planted, they call it. They took over a church that already had its traditions and cultures and, and baggage and all kind of stuff. And I feel sorry for them. You know, we, so we, I've, we've had a kind of different experience than established churches, traditions, and cultures. However, it's still a challenge, like being a pastor and talking to people. Like when I meet new people and I'm in conversation, and they ask me what I do for a living, sometimes I'm tempted to lie. <laughs> I never do, but I've been tempted to, like, to lie about what I do for a living because every time I tell people that I'm a pastor, the conversation changes, you know? It just, it just, it just goes in a whole, sometimes I'm able to like share my faith, and, but more often than not, it goes in one of two directions, you guys. One direction, immediately what you for a living, and I go, oh, I'm a pastor of a church, one direction is that it gets so religious. It just gets so weird. Like we're just having a good conversation, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, praise the Lord, hallelujah, <laughs> glory to God, past brother Jason, brother Jason. <laughs> I'm a Christian too. And, and it just gets weird, and I'm like, oh gosh, okay. And then or, or it goes in this other direction where I, mean, I, I actually had this at an airport. I was talking to someone, having a good conversation. I told them, you know, and I had like, I had the temptation, what do you do for a living? And I had the temptation to lie because it was just going so good. But I didn't. I said, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. And he goes, oh, like, <laughs> it just like, <laughs> chan. I was like, oh, here we go. Oh, and he said, he said, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't like religious people. And I told him, I said, that's okay. I don't like religious people either. <laughs> I said, in fact, that's one of the reasons why I started a new church. <laughs> so it took him back a little bit. He like got surprised. He was like, what do you mean? You're a pastor. You're supposed to like love people, especially religious people. And I'm like, yeah, no, I love, I do love all people, but I have a particular weakness for people who make uh, their, their, their relationship with God a religious thing because at its heart, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. So I just started having this conversation, which actually turned out to be really cool and really, really fun. But I get it, man. I really think that, like, I understand the tension. For those of you that feel that tension, or you're watching and you feel that tension of like, man, Jesus is so good and I love the Bible. I just cannot fit in or feel like, like, or just what I see maybe in the church is not what I see in the scriptures. And you just have this, I like Jesus, but don't like church kind of feeling, I do sympathize. I sympathize with that, but I don't think the answer is giving up on church. I don't. I think, I think the answer is we need a new kind of church for a new generation. Or let me say it better this way. It's not even a new kind of church. I just think we need to get back to what God's idea of church was, okay? Like we need his idea, because you do realize that the church was God's idea, right? That the church was, was established by Jesus himself. He created and established the church. And, and in fact, like your New Testament, in your Bible, the New Testament, most of what is written inside of your New Testament was written to churches, was written to churches or to the context of being in Christian community called the church. So, so if you are like, like not in church, but you're trying to like love God and have a relationship with God and even apply the Bible to your life, you are not even living the proper context of life to apply the principles and truths from the word of God. 
Like you're trying to apply it to your life, but that's not what the Bible was written to you roaming throughout your Christian life. It was actually written to, most of the, of, of the letters are written to Christians within the church. Let me show you one example. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, this is the Apostle Paul writing to a pastor named Timothy. He was a pastor in Ephesus, and it says, I'm writing to you these letters so that you'll know how to live in the family of God. And that family is what? It's the church. It's the church. See, see the, church is not, the church is not a business. It's a body. It's not an organization. It's an organism. It is a family. That's what Jesus established it. And so it actually, in the Bible, the, the church is called the bride of Christ. It's the bride. See, okay, to love me is to love my wife and my kids. You can't have a relationship with me and hate my wife. You can't have a relationship with me and hate my kids. Now we're fighting, right? Now we're fighting. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay? See, see, we want a relationship with God, but you want to walk in division and disposition towards her, his wife. Or even gossip and talk bad about his kids. And you have good reason. You say you have good reason. And I get it. No, don't get me wrong. I sympathize with your reasons of why some of us have been disenfranchised with church organizationally. I, I get it, but let's get back to God's design, okay? Because here's, here's the truth. A Christian without a church family is a spiritual orphan. That, that's, if the church is the family of God, which is biblical, that's, then, then in, it, to be disconnected from that family is to be a spiritual orphan. But but let's get, let's get real. Let's get honest. In this series, we're going to answer the questions like, why? Why is that happening in some people's lives where, where they like Jesus, but they just don't like church? C.S. Lewis said it best. He said, the problem with Christianity is Christians. Come on, somebody. How many of you know that to be true, right? Or, or, okay, so we're going to be bringing like, like, what are those, I think, the main reasons today? I'm going to bring to you what is the number one complaint. The number one complaint from non-Christians about Christians. How many, of you, how many of you think you know what it is? Do you know what it is? The number one complaint? The church is just a bunch of hypocrites. Oh, you got it. You got it. That we're, so we're going to be talking about these, these, the hypocrisy that so many people see and are turned off by the church because of it. How many of you know a hypocrite? Anyone know a hypocrite? Anyone? Have you ever been hypocritical sometimes? Okay. All right. Okay. So let me lay some groundwork here because we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about the hypocrisy in church and even sometimes that mm, can, can live within our own, our own hearts. What does it mean to be a hypocrite? Here's, here's the, the biblical definition. Like when you see hypocrite in the scriptures, it's the Greek word in your New Testament. Don't know how to say it. Hippocrates. I don't know. Um, here's what it means. It actually, that Greek word was the, the title, the name of actors on the stage. It was a theater term. So the hypocrite was a stage actor. The, specifically, the hypocrite was the one who wore a mask on the stage. There's someone who's hiding behind a mask. They're portraying something on the outward that is not really happening on the inside. So outwardly, you're smiling, but inwardly, you're depressed. Outwardly, you say, God, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, but inwardly, you're afraid. Come on, are you hearing this, you guys? That's what it means to be a hypocrite. Um, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus has this, like, it, what's called the seven woes. He just, whoa, 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 woe to these religious people. The religious people of their Jesus' time were full of hypocrites. And he says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 28, about the hypocrites, the religious people of, of Jesus' time. He says, outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. And before you get all like, you know, self-righteous on me, this is engraved in humanity. Every one of us. A lot of you, when you were younger, your dad told you, don't cry, don't you cry, don't you cry now, be a man. We don't cry. And so inwardly you were hurt, you were broken, you had pain, but outwardly, you were showing something else. You know that's a hypocrite? That's the literal definition of hypocrite. Or how many of you have you heard this? Fake it till you make it, man. Now, fake it till you make it. Not, not in Christ. You don't fake it till you make it. You faith it till you make it. Amen, somebody? Galatians chapter 6, verse 3 says this. 
if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. So, so the hypocrite isn't even, they're not just trying to fool you. The hypocrite is trying to fool themselves. So what are they trying to fool themselves into thinking? They're trying to fool themselves into thinking, if I, just, if I can wear this mask good enough, maybe this could be my reality. If I, can, if I can pretend good enough, like I'm happy, maybe I will be happy. If I can pretend that everything is going okay in my life or in my marriage or my fine, maybe, maybe that will be, it'll just be my reality. I can just live like this with this mask on. I'll just never take the mask off. So we're trying to deceive ourselves, the Bible says. So the question is like, what do we do? How do we deal with the hypocrites in our life? Is Because the answer isn't to just run away from people, to abandon the church altogether. What do we do? We've all seen them. You, the, it could be someone in your group, in your group. You got, you got a buddy in the group, man, in your small group. They're, they dip the, the chip with you. They enjoy the conversation with you all while they're cheating on their wife. And you know it. Do you have any responsibility to with, with that, or, or maybe it's that, that, that teenager, that discovery in discovery youth, that, that man, they look like a Christian, they say they're a Christian, but they're drinking on the weekends and chasing girls. What do, you, what do we do? How do we handle, how do we handle that? Or maybe it's, it's your friend that you play sports with, that, that they, they just talk so bad about church and Christians and, and pastors and leaders, and they don't even know themselves that they're engaging in gossip and division, being a hypocrite themselves. What do you do? Did that one bite somebody? Okay. All right. So what, what, what role do we have to play in the situation? Do we have any role? Do we just stand back? Stand back and pray? Do we tell them, do we get up all in their business and tell them like what to do and what they shouldn't do and how they should? What is our, what's our role? So the first question we have to ask ourselves with hypocrisy and dealing with hypocrites is why? Why are they acting this way? Because why they're acting the, this way determines how we respond. Did you catch that, you guys? Okay, this is extremely important when dealing with hypocrisy and hypocrites. Why they are acting that way determines how we are going to respond. So there's one of three reasons why someone may look like they're a hypocrite or acting maybe what looks like hypocrisy. Write these down. Here's the first reason why. Why? Number one is they don't really know God. Maybe, maybe, this, maybe they're not really a hypocrite. Maybe they're just, they just haven't been spiritually born again. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. So instead of them being like a hypocrite, look, just because they go to church doesn't make them a Christian. One pastor said, just because you're standing in the garage doesn't make you a car. Just like standing in a church doesn't make you a Christian. Jesus said it like this, Matthew 7 and 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So what do we do? Should we go to church? Yes, you still go. It's a biblical principle that you should be a part of a church, but just because somebody attends a church doesn't mean that they are a Christian. In fact, here at Discovery, we say that you can belong before you ever believe. Like you could be here for, for years or months and like just around the conversation and around it, and they're not even a believer in Christ, okay? So the reason why they're acting that way, maybe they don't really know God. That, see, this person is not the hypocrite. This person is someone who needs the grace of Jesus, that's, that's what they need. They don't need your judgment and your finger pointing. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what this person, this person needs. I was, uh, I was one of those Christians, uh, and you probably were too, uh, who needed the grace of Jesus Christ at some point in your life. Why they act that way determines how we respond. Maybe, maybe they don't really know God. Here's a second reason. Maybe they just don't know better yet. Maybe they're kind of new to the faith. Maybe they're, they haven't been discipled or taught how they're supposed to live their life. In fact, Paul was dealing with this problem in the church at Corinth among a lot of problems that the Corinthian church had. This was one of them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
It says, he says this, I couldn't address you guys as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. He's talking to the church here going, man, I wish I could talk to you and take you guys a little bit deeper. In other words, he says, you've been forgiven, you've been changed by Jesus, but you really haven't grown yet. You haven't spiritually matured yet. You're still a baby in Christ. Now listen, this person does not need your correcting. This person needs your instructing. This person isn't really the hypocrite. They're just, no, no, just like you wouldn't call your five-year-old a hypocrite. What they don't need is, your, is, again, your name calling and you kicking them out of the house, telling them you're no son of mine. No, what they need is to be raised up. Amen, somebody? Yeah. They need instructing. Maybe they're seeming like a hypocrite because they didn't know, they just don't know better yet. I, I received Christ when I was 13 years old. But, but I never got connected to a church or to a group or to a pastor, or was mentored or discipled in any way. So as I, as, and I had a real lot, like I, I had an encounter with Jesus and gave my heart to Jesus, even got baptized. But that's where it ended for me. So I became one of those teenagers that, that partied and drank and smoked and just was like, when someone used the Lord's name in vain around me, I'd be holding a joint in one hand, okay, and a beer in the other hand. I'd be like, don't you use the Lord's name in vain around me, man. Here, take this. <laughs> chill out, bro. Chill out. I was that. The only time I would pray was like, I would literally pray that I didn't get a DUI or pray that, that I didn't get arrested or go thrown into jail for the crazy stuff I was doing. Okay. Now, what I, I did not need the correcting of some, what I needed is instruction in the word of God. See, because eventually the word of God would be brought into my life and the word of God brought the correction and instruction that needed in my heart. Amen, somebody? Understanding why someone's behaving the way they are helps us determine what we actually do. Hebrews chapter 5, the author of Hebrews says this, like we got much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because here's what he says, you no longer even try to understand. You just got to this place in your faith, in your Christianity, where you thought this is good enough. I don't need to know any more of God. I don't need to study the Bible anymore. I'm good. I don't need to like go any further. I don't need to be used anymore. I don't need to understand purpose and destiny. No, no, no. This is enough. And the author of Hebrews is saying, look, I'd love to reveal even more to you, but you stopped caring about your growth in Christ at some point. I don't know who I'm preaching to right now. He says, in fact, though by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. He says, you need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk is being still an infant and is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food, he said, is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So maybe, maybe here it is, they just why are they acting this way? Maybe they've never been truly born into God's family. Or maybe they just haven't been discipled or equipped. They don't know better yet. Or the third kind of reason why, and this is where we're going to be preaching about today, is they know better, but they still disobey God. Okay, this is the hypocrite who knows what God's will is and what God wants them to do, yet they're living opposite of that. They're dishonoring God by the way they live, okay? Jesus dealt with these type of people, the, rel the religious leaders of his time that were hypocrites. The Pharisees, a lot of them were, were hypocrites. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, he said to them, watch yourselves carefully. Now he's talking about like, he's talking to the people in, in the crowd like you. Watch yourself carefully so you don't get contaminated with the Pharisee yeast. He called it Pharisee phoniness. Be careful that you just get around religion enough. You get around, kind of, you get acclimated to the ch culture of church. You get acclimated to just putting on, you, you wear that mask enough, and you're going to lean into that mask your whole life. Be careful that you don't continue to try to fool people when acting like everything's okay when it's not okay. 
the hypocrites, they do, they do two things, and they do two things really well. Here's the two things they do. The first thing, they focus on the external, okay? So they look the part, they sound the part, they dress the part, they may even talk the part, but inwardly, they're dishonoring, disobeying, they're, they're being someone else than who they're projecting. Jesus said in Matthew 23 that everything they do is just for show. They're just kind of putting on a show for people. You know, every, every like big holiday season, I get some, every now and then religious people, and forgive me if you've ever asked this, okay, but you get people that want to get in a debate with me about the Easter bunny, about Santa Claus, about Halloween, how come you're doing Harvest Festival, how, how, how come, and then, or about all these things, and I'm like, really? Is that what you want to talk about? You want to talk, is that what is most important to you, the Easter bunny? Because here, if you want to get real, you're real with you, let's get real, okay? Let me see your internet history. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about how, the way you treat your wife and your kids. Can we talk about that? Can we talk, let me look at your bank account. Let me look at your calendar. Now, really, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But what I'm saying is your religion is comfortable as long as it's philosophical and never practical or personal. It's just as long as I can keep the conversation out here and let's just debate out here and never talk about what's going on in here or up here. That's, that is a Pharisee phoniness to just talk about everything, everything out here. That's the, the, re, hypocrites, religious hypocrites, focus on the external. And then here's the second thing they do really well, is they hide behind the rules. They hide behind the rules. So, so again, the hypocrite, he, he may look the part and sound the part. He does all the right things, but all the right things is just a cover-up for what's really going on. Jesus, again, in Matthew 23, he had a lot to say about hypocrites. He says, they crush people with their unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. So they're just like, they hide behind that, that rule, and they even try to enforce those rules on other people. That standard on other people, well, what you need to do, and don't do this, and don't do that, that's just religious hypocrisy. So what do we do? Do we give up on church altogether? Is it none of our business? Judge not, lest you be judged kind of thing. Is there, do I have a role to play in this thing, or do I, what's, what do we do? It's so important that we get this right as a church, as disciples, as followers of Christ, because if we get this wrong, you guys, then we could, we could end up hurting people. We could end up hurting people. We could hurt ourselves, and, and we could be a bad witness to a watching world that's looking how we, how we treat each other and how we walk out this faith. So this is extremely important to get this right. How do we deal with people who like wearing a mask, who outwardly are one thing, but inwardly are doing something different? I do not believe at all that, that, the, that we should give up on church. I think we should deal with it, but I think we should do, deal with it prayerfully, okay? Let me give you, instead of you running away from church or the bride of Christ and community and, and kind of existing outside of the circle and, you know, pointing your fingers from the outward, looking in at it, I got a better solution for you. I think we actually should do something about it. I think that's what love does. Let me, so here's, here's what prayerful confrontation to hypocrisy should look like in a new kind of church for a new kind of generation. Here's number one. Take some notes, you guys. The first prayer I got for you is, God, help me to confront with the goal of restoration. That's the goal, right? The heart matters. Your motive for confronting somebody, it matters. Oh, why we're going, like we don't want to just shame them and hurt them. No, your motive matters. Galatians chapter six, verse one tells us this. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on the right path. So if you see somebody wandering, if you see somebody projecting one thing and living another, where they're trying to, they're wearing that mask, but inwardly they're dishonoring God, it's our job, listen, followers of Jesus, to do something about it gently and humbly, help lead them back on the path of freedom, the path of life, help lead them back. So here's the, here's the principle, you guys. See, you are not the judge, you're the guide. You're, you're not the judge. You're the guide. You're not to judge what's right and wrong. You're to guide them gently and humbly back to where God wants them to be. Let me put it this way. Your goal is not to be right. 
Your goal is to help someone else be right with God. See, that's, a, that's so huge. Some of you need to take that to heart, even in your marital conversations, okay? And your conversation with your kids and the dysfunctional relationships we have. Your goal is not to be right in the argument. Your goal is to help them be right with God. That, that's, the, that's the goal. I had a friend who came from a legalistic background. There was a lot of like do's and don'ts and shaming and guilt. Um, so when they grew up, you know, he started to drink a little bit socially. And something he was not able to do at all. And he actually heard it the wrong way, like, you don't, don't, don't. So he drank socially, but he never got drunk. Never got drunk. He just had a little, and he had some with his friends, even Christian friends and stuff. And he was even told afterward, like, like you know, point the finger, like, you are supposed to be. And, and he, like, I just, you know, he didn't want any of that. Um, but I went to this, this brother. I said, hey, um, I know you love God, and I know love, that you love people, and you want to lead people to like love God more. Um, and what, what you may not realize is that that young, there he had, he had a younger person in his circle that he would just drink occasionally with. This younger person started getting drunk more and more and more. They were just impressionable. And then he started smoking weed again and partying again. And, just, just, and so I went to him and said, hey, bro, I know you love God and I know you love people. And I know like you, you're free to like have a drink if you want, but I want you to just, will you pray about this? Because because what you're doing may not be doing that, like leading people to love God more. So, hey, do me a favor, bro, because I love you. Will you just pray about that? And then he prayed about it, and he actually curtailed it. doesn't drink around, like, socially any, anymore. Um, and I'm not saying drinking is wrong. I'm not saying that, like, don't get, I'm just saying, like, like pray about it. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And he started, and he even thanked, he curtailed it a little bit, and he, and he even thanked me. You know why? Here's why. Because truth Without grace is mean. Grace without truth is meaningless. But truth and grace together is medicine. You think about Jesus of how he handled, like the, the woman who was caught in adultery. In John chapter 8, if you've never read that, Jesus, these religious leaders threw this woman who was caught in adultery to Jesus' feet. And, and, and the Bible says Jesus came full of grace and truth. Can you imagine if, it was, if Jesus just showed all grace there? If he was like, don't worry about it. Just next time, don't get caught, girl. Just go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> That'd be bad, right? Or, or what if it was all truth? What if he was like, yeah, you dirty sinner woman. You gotta repent in front of all these people. In fact, give me that stone. That would have been bad, right? That would have been bad. Can we all agree, okay? But Jesus was full of grace and truth. The Bible says he knelt down and he started writing in the sand. And we don't know what he wrote. A lot of scholars believe it was actually the sins of everyone who was watching. Because the Bible says that one by one, they dropped their stones and they left until it was just her and Jesus. And Jesus kneels down to her. And in grace, he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, there are none. And in grace, Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. But then in truth, he says, now go your way and sin no more. So what's the answer? The answer is grace and truth. It's truth and grace. It's, it's, it's both. We need both. So when we confront, God help us to confront uh, people with the goal of restoration. But then that scripture, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 continues, and it ends with this. It says, and be careful, though, not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So write it down like this. Number two, God, when I'm dealing with hypocrisy and hip hypocrites, Help me to confront them carefully. You want to be very, very careful at this moment. Anytime you posture yourself as someone who is on the correcting end, you become vulnerable to pride. We all know what pride, about pride, right? Pride comes before the fall. It's probably why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, he said, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Anytime you put yourself on the correcting end, you confront someone carefully because the moment we think we're better than someone else, you open yourself up to the lies of the enemy. Oh, I would never. Oh, I would never do that. I'm so much more holy, more godly, more, mm, I would never do something like that. You, you, better, you better be careful. The moment you do that, you're vulnerable to a fall. I, I had this experience years ago in, in a church where there was this, this gay couple who came to the church. 
And I celebrated it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like that they that we have people who are far away from God coming to church. And I celebrated it. But there was this other church leader who actually disparaged it and was like, oh no, that's and what he said is that's actually gonna contaminate. The church, and I know it's disgusting, but hear me out. I, I, and it just was breaking my heart to hear him respond this, this way to someone who needs the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and he went on to just explain how, oh no, sexual sins, especially homosexuality, God treats them differently and that's going to contaminate the church. And, and so anyway, we kind of had different views about what the Bible says about you know being far away from Jesus. And, and then... He actually, about a year and a half later, he was asked to step down because he was cheating on his wife. Hypocrisy. Watch, by the way, if you're here and you're living a gay lifestyle, just know we love you. You'll be accepted here. No, we'll love you here. But here's, here's what I want you to know. It's not about even my opinion. About uh, I believe the Bible and what the Word of God says, and that is the standard of our living. I love you. You're not going to get finger pointed down your face here. No, no, no. But you should know we believe in the entire word of God. The, Bi the Bible does say that to live in sin and opposition to God, that's not, that's not his will for your life. But how I'm going to do that? No, I see. Look here, guys. I can't change you, but I can lead you to the one who can. Okay, that's, that's, that's my role. My role is not to change anybody. My role is to present the truth of God's word and to help lead you to the presence of the only person who can change us from the inside out. So, so God help us, help us if we ever start st sticking up our nose at people and acting like they, they, they are content. That, that is, that's hypocrisy, you guys. So help us, God, help me to confront carefully. The Bible has a lot to say about this, about how to confront in conflict and hypocrisy and things like that. You may want to go read Matthew 18 if you've never read it before or you just need a refresher. We actually have like a principle here at Discovery, uh, like to confront and having heart to hearts, we call it Matthew 18. When we have a heart to heart that is that is needing to talk, talk about a difficult thing, a confrontational thing, it's called a Matthew 18. And in Matthew 18, it clearly kind of let me just kind of give you the, the rundown of Matthew 18. Then I got to hurry, you guys. It, it says if your brother or sister, if your brother or sister sins against you, so right there you already know that it's this isn't talking about non Christians. You cannot hold non Christians. To your Christian standard. Amen, somebody? Like, that's not, that's, that's not whatever God wants us to do. You, you don't change your behavior again. You introduce them to the one who can. That's not our role. The Holy Spirit is the, is the one who can change them. So if your brother or sister sins against you, you go to them just between the two of you, is what the Scripture says. And in Greek, what that means is not on Facebook. That's what that means, okay? <laughs> so what you do is you just go to them... <laughs> One on one. That's what that's what the scriptures say. All right. But but between the two of you implies there's a relationship. I'm not going to someone based upon my outward perspective and not really knowing what's going on in their lives. I'm not going with them with a perspective. I'm going with them because I'm in relationship with them and I do know what's going on. Okay? That's the principle of confrontation. If your brother or sister, the Bible says if they listen, you won them over. Okay, you see some hypocrisy and you go to them in love with truth and grace and they listen, you won them over. But if they don't, the Bible says, hey, take another brother with you or sister. Go to them and try to implore them. And, like, and if they still don't listen, it says take them before the, a church leader. And then if they still don't listen, the Bible says in Matthew 18, redefine that relationship. They can't, don't, don't, don't. And that may sound harsh to you, but listen to me, that is one of the most loving things that you can do to somebody. It's to not let them wear the mask not let them be a friend. You, be, in my, be in my inner circle. Be my friend. And I'm going to let you live in a way that's portraying something that you're not destroying your life. I love you too much, man. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you. That's, that's what the Matthew 18 principle is all about. So we got to get this right, you guys. God, help us to confront with the heart to restore. God, help us to confront carefully. And then number three is God, help me to recognize when I'm the hypocrite. Uh, you thought you were going to get off easy today, didn't you? Because aren't we talking about them? <laughs> let's, let's continue to talk about people out there. No, God, help me to see. Because Jesus actually called the hypocrites blind guides. They're blind fools. It, meaning this, hypocrisy is so easy to spot in somebody else. But it's so hard to see in me. I'm blind 
a lot of times to my own hypocrisy. We have to recognize this because the group that Jesus talked about, had a, he had a lot to say about the, the, the group that Jesus called hypocrites most were religious people. So you got to be careful. You got you to learn how to recognize hypocrisy inside of us. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others just to be seen by them. I just want to appear. So I'm going to go to church and I'm going to go to group, but I am going to serve and do all those things. Please do those things. He wants you to do those things, but don't do those things with a mask. Okay. And I'm going to show you how in just, just a moment, but be careful that you're just not doing it to put on a show, projecting something that you're not. And he says, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. That's not why we give to be seen by others. And when you pray, don't do it again like those hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others. And this is why. Jesus says, because truly I tell you that every reward that they got on earth is all they're ever going to get. They're not going to get anything from me in heaven. All their reward will be from the accolades of the people that they were wearing the mask for, that they were playing the game for. It's so easy to get caught up in hypocrisy. It really is Um, to get just a hypocritical spirit. David learned this in the Old Testament. A lot of you know the story of David, the friend of God, someone who was close to God, wrote a lot of the Psalms and stuff. But the Bible says in a time where kings should have been at war, he wasn't at war. He actually slipped slipped up hard, man. He, he, He committed adultery with a woman and tried to hide it and cover up and had her husband killed and thought he did a good job. And he's just wearing the mask. He's like, okay, no, I'm King David, the friend of God. Here I am. And he was doing a pretty good job covering it up. So he thought until a prophet named Nathan came visiting him. And y'all know the story. He told, he told him, he told him his story, this kind of fabricated story about this, this poor man who had this young lamb and loved this lamb and the kids loved it, slept with it. It was a friend of the family, and, but this rich ruler had a whole bunch of stuff. And this, this guy comes through the, their town, their region, and instead of sacrificing the rich man, one of his many cattle that he had, he took the one baby lamb from the kids and from that family and killed it and fed it to the man. And, and, and David was furious. David is like, what? This is the worst thing I've ever... He says this in 2 Samuel chapter 12, David burned with anger against the man's... Uh, the, and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay, he said, for that lamb you know, four times over because he did such a thing. He had no pity. And Nathan told David, you are the hypocrite. That's you. You're the man in this story. That's you, David. And the thing is, he's furious and, and, and he's so blind. He's furious at them, but he's so blind at the hypocrisy going on inside of himself. I have found that, that the thing that you're most judgmental about is, that, is the place that you're most vulnerable in your own heart. The thing that you criticize most about people is where you are actually most vulnerable to the enemy bringing you down. And we beca- that's why we all got to be careful when we become uh, spec inspectors. You know what I mean? You got to spec. You got to spec in your eye, spec in your eye, spec in your eye, spec in your eye. And, and all the while, there's a big old log in our eye. Jesus is like, why in the world are you trying to point out people's issues? You got issues yourself. First deal with your own issues before you start jumping up in somebody's business. So what do we do, church? What do we do? Uh, we have to guard ourselves from hypocrisy because it's easy. It is. And we can become blind to it. So how do we guard ourselves as a church, as, as the family, so we can keep that religious spirit off of Discovery Church. I'm going to give you a few ways how to guard our church, our family, your lives from hypocrisy. Number one, you got to choose authenticity over hypocrisy. What do I mean by authenticity? Please hear me. It is okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be. You're, I'm not okay all the time. You ain't okay all the time. And here at Discovery, you don't have to wear a mask because it's okay. You're not going to be judged or condemned or shoved out in seasons of your life where when it's not okay. It's okay that it's not okay. Choose that. Choose authenticity over hypocrisy. And how do we do it? How do, because if you're just coming 
You're treating church like an event to go to instead of a family to belong to. You will eventually just start putting on a mask and saying, God bless you. God bless you. Smiling, putting on your Sunday clothes. God bless you. Shaking hands and kissing babies and stuff. And no, we don't do that here at Discovery, by the way. No kissing babies. Don't kiss the baby. But here's how you do it. Acts chapter two says this. All the believers in the early church, that church that we need to get back to, man, that, that, that church, the original design, they met together constantly. And they shared everything with each other. They didn't, they didn't hide it. They didn't put on masks. Here's, it, 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 here's what you need to do if, you want, if we want to guard this church, guard our family from hypocrisy. Get into a group and be open. Be honest. We call it here at Discovery, real, relaxed, and relevant. Just get real. Just get on. Like You don't need to do it with everybody. I'm not asking you to get up on this stage and tell everybody your secrets. I'm saying find a couple friends. Just find a couple friends, man, and get real and get honest. Get authentic and say, here, this is what's not okay in my life. And just see what God does, man. If not, if, you, if we don't do that, you're the man. If you're not going to be authentic and get into a group, eventually a Nathan is going to come into your life and say, you're the woman. Out your amen, somebody. Come on. Everybody wants the truth, but no one wants to be honest. Okay, look, here at Discovery, look, we don't fix people. We, we, we lead them to the person who does, okay? I can't fix you. Discovery can't fix you. I know who can, though, okay? I know who can, I know who can fix you real, who can change you from the inside out. So how do we guard it? Choose authenticity over hypocrisy. And then here's the second thing that we need to do. Operate by relationship, not rules. Okay, so when you get into a group and you make a few friends, don't throw the rule book at them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't, don't be like, oh, don't do that. You shouldn't do that. You can't do that. Don't be doing da, 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 da. Don't, don't Don't throw the rule book at people. No, operate by relationship. It reminds me of a story. I got to hurry. It reminds me of a story, though. This is, there was this lady who was seeing all of her friends, a married, a married woman, seeing all of her friends posting stories uh, they're her friend's husband's posting stories about their wife and their relationship and their marriage. And she went to her husband and says, honey, how come you don't ever post about me? Man, how many know what I'm talking about here? You probably had this. How come you never, honey, do you not, why don't you do that? I want to feel loved by you in front of everybody. He's like, I don't even have a Facebook woman. I don't like that stuff. And she's like, you need a Facebook. Come on, get it. And so she's like trying to hammer him because she wants public affection from him. He don't do it till finally she said, look, I'm a, creative, I'm a creative for you. This is how you post. Let me show you. This is how you put You should do it. Here, here's the passwords. Here's the passwords. Here's a good time. She was even like, here's a good time. You should take a picture right now. You should take a picture. He just wouldn't do it. So eventually she just got on there and posted herself. She said, I'm just going to post myself on his account. <laughs> oh, she's looking good today, heart, heart, heart. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That's like, like I, and I don't even like really get that, but, but listen, that's how we treat our relationship with God sometimes, don't we? That, that we want it to look like something on the outside when internally it's not really happening. That's not really who we are or how we're living our life. It's not really, our faith isn't really that strong. We don't really know that much of the word. I just kind of, just, just because I posted the scripture doesn't mean I know it. There's a lot of people who are trying to live. Listen to me, you cannot get closer to God by obeying rules. Hear that, please. You cannot get closer to God by obeying rules. And so many people, their Christian life, you've been maybe living your Christian life trying to stay in bounds. Oh, I just gotta, just try to stay in bounds here. Just try to follow the rules here. If I could just get it right, get it right, get it right. You're never gonna be closer to Jesus by just trying to get it, get it right. If we wanna guard God's church, the family of God, from the spirit of hypocrisy, that religious spirit, we don't want in this place that you need to start operating by relationship, not rules. Relationship. A lot of you know the story of the prodigal son. I don't, I don't know what caused that, that son. In Luke chapter 15, one of the sons, the younger son, actually wanted his inheritance from the father. And, and I don't know what caused him to, to not want to be in his father's house anymore. I don't know if it was the rules, the regulations, the responsibilities. I just like, I'm tired of this. I just want to, I just want to live my own life. I just want to live my own life. But we're told that he's, the father says, here you go then. Here's your inheritance. Go for it. And he goes and parties, the Bible says. Wild living, orgies and stuff. And he just 
Sex, ro- sex, drugs, and rock and roll is what today would be, right? He just, he just goes, goes ham at it. But he finds himself in a pig pen at the bottom of a barrel, right? He's just, the Bible says that, that there's a moment happened in his life where he's just like, this is, something's got to change. And he comes back to the father. And the father receives him with open arms. With open arms, he runs to him. And he receives him. And I want, some of you are here today and you're afraid of how you would be received because of how you lived. And I want you to know that, that you are not going to get the rule book thrown at you. The father did not throw the rule book at him because if he did, that son would have deserved death. Like from what he was doing, the actual, there was laws in place that he was, he was defiled. Either prison, death, beating something, and he didn't. The father loved him and embraced him. Luke chapter 15 says this, that when he finally came to his senses, this, this son that was living in a wild life. He came to his senses and he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. And here's the statement I want you to resonate with. He said, I will go home. And some of you today need to make that decision. I don't know what it was that caused you to leave the house of God, to leave the father's house. And to do your own, I don't know if it was the rules, it was the regulations, it was the religious thing. I don't know what it was that caused you to go, but I'm praying today that that's, you will come to your senses and realize you belong in God's house. You belong at home. And when you come, listen, you're going to be received, accepted, loved. The robe is going to be thrown over your shoulders, the ring put back on your finger, sandals on your feet. But there's others of you, there was another son in the story, and there's other, others of you that probably resonate with this guy. Here's what the Bible says of the older son who never ran away, who stayed in the house. He sees the son come home, should be stoned. He should be beat. He's defiled and dirty, but he gets a party. He gets love. He gets acceptance. And the son is indignant about what he perceives as hypocrisy. This guy is a hypocrite. This, my younger brother's a hypocrite. Try to call himself, what family, what kind of family are you? You haven't been here. I'm the one who's been working. The older brother was so angry that he wouldn't go into the house. There's others of you, you're the older brother. And you're staying outside of the house, looking in, going, what a bunch of hypocrites. And some of you are older brothers, you know it. You know the word of God, you know Jesus. You love Jesus, but you don't like church. And the father is coming and he's begging you come back home. You belong in my house just as much as he and she and him and her. They belong in my house. Come back home. Can I pray that over your life today? With every head bowed, every eye closed. A lot of you are in one of those two camps today. Some of you have been have been so far away from God and today you're coming to your senses like you know, you realize that it's time to come home. It's time to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Others of you, you've kind of walked away from the house of God and you need to, it's time to come back home. You're the older brother. You're the older sister. You kind of is existing as a Christian outside of the church and it's time to come home. With every head bow and eye close, can I just pray for you if you're here and maybe just that first group, if you need to give your life to Jesus, maybe for the very first time, or you need to do it again today, I'd love to pray for you to come home. You just come just as you are and let God start to work in your life from the inside out. That'll start happening right now. If that's you and you're here today or you're watching, you're not going to have to stand up or come up to the front or anything. I just want to pray with you right where you are. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to count to three. And at the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand or type in the chat, I need Jesus. If that's you and you're ready for a fresh start today, come on, be bold with me. One, two, three. Come on back home right now. I need to come home. I need a fresh start with Jesus. I need Jesus right there. Yes, 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 yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Thank you, God. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Couldn't put your hands down. When you pray something like this, say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I recognize I need you, and I give you my life. I surrender the control. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Help me to live for you, God, from this day forward. God, I speak over every person that's here today. 
that is that older brother, that's that older sister, that we know the word, we know the truth, but we've allowed ourselves to exist outside of the house because our own personal hurts and issues. And, and, and maybe even some of that hypocrisy and stuff of what's going on in that house, of things we perceive. But today, Jesus, you're calling us home. You're begging us to come back to the family. If that's, that, if that's you today, if you've existed outside of the house of God, and you just sense the Lord, the Father begging you, come back home. You belong in this house. You're my son, you're my daughter. And I just pray for you right there, God. Help me. Help me, God, to stop looking so judgmentally, to stop carrying this hurt with me, to stop trying to do this alone. I don't want to do it alone anymore. Today, God, I'm coming back in the house, a house that is far from perfect, a house that is messy, a house, though, that is full of grace and truth. God, I'm coming back home. Help me, Lord to dig some roots, and to help this house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord some praise if you receive that today. Amen. Amen.